Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 3rd, 2002, the gentleman from Texas, uh, gentleman Paul, is recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the majority leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> Before I get into my special order that deals with foreign policy, in which I make the case for defending America, I would like to make a few comments about the uh, campaign finance reform and the discharge pe pe uh, petition that was just uh, mentioned by our previous colleagues. I do not share the enthusiasm that they do about uh, bringing such a bill to the floor. I certainly don't share the enthusiasm of passing such legislation because it sets us backwards if our goal here is to defend liberty and minimize the size of government. The one thing I agree with him entirely with is that the problem exists. There is no doubt there is a uh, uh, huge influence of money here in Washington. And even in my prepared statement, I mentioned how corporations influence our foreign policy. And that something ought to be done about it. But campaign finance reform goes in exactly the wrong direction. It just means more regulations, more controls, telling the American people how they can spend their money and how they can lobby Congress and how they can campaign. That's not the problem. The problem is that we have members of Congress that yield to the temptation and the influence of money. If we had enough members around here that didn't yield to the temptation, you don't have to have campaign finance reform, and you don't have to regulate money, and you don't have to undermine the First Amendment, and you don't have to undermine the Constitution in that effort. I agree with the problem. But I believe the resistance could be here without much change. The ultimate solution to the need for campaign finance reform comes only when we have a constitutional type government, where government's not doing the things that they should be doing. There is a logical incentive for corporations and many individuals to come to Washington because they can buy influence and buy benefits and buy contracts. The government was never meant to do that. The government was set up to protect liberty. And yet we have devised a system here where money talks, and it is important, but let me tell you one thing. The Campaign Finance Reform Act, it's coming down the pike, will do nothing to solve the problem and will do a lot to undermine our freedoms, a lot to undermine the First Amendment, and do nothing to preserve the Constitution. My special order, as I said, has to do with foreign policy. It's, it's entitled The Case for uh, Defending America. As we begin this uh, new legislative session, we cannot avoid reflecting on this past year. All Americans will remember the moment and place when tragedy hit us on September 11th. We also know that a good philosophy to follow is to turn adversity into something positive, if at all possible. Although we have suffered for years from a flawed foreign policy and, and we're, we're already in a recession before the attacks, the severity of these events has forced many of us to reassess our foreign and domestic policies. Hopefully, positive changes will come of this. It's just as well that the economy was already in a recession for six months prior to the September attacks. Otherwise, the temptation would have been too great to blame the attacks for the weak economy rather than look for the government policies responsible for the recession. Terrorist attacks alone, no matter how disruptive, could never be the source of a significant economic downturn. A major debate over foreign policy has naturally resulted from this crisis. Dealing with the shortcomings of our policies of the past is essential. We were spending $40 billion a year on intelligence gathering that, we must admit, failed. This tells us a problem exists. There are shortcomings with our $320 billion DOD budget that did not provide the protection Americans expect. Obviously, a proper response to the terrorists requires sound judgment in order to prevent further suffering of the innocent or foolishly bring about a worldwide conflict. One of the key responsibilities of the federal government in providing for national defense is protection of liberty here at home. Unwisely responding to the attacks could undermine our national defense while threatening our liberties. 
What we have done so far since last September is not very reassuring. What we do here in the Congress in the coming months may well determine the survival of our republic. Fear and insecurity must not drive our policies. Sacrificing personal liberty should never be an option. Involving ourselves in every complex conflict around the globe hardly enhances our national security. The special interests that were already lined up at the public trough should not be permitted to use the ongoing crisis as an opportunity to demand even more benefits. Let us all remember why the U.S. Congress was established, what our responsibilities are, and what our oath of office means. It's been reported that since nine, the 9-11 attacks, big government answers have gained in popularity and people fearful, fearful for their security have looked to the federal government for help. Polls indicate that acceptance of government solution to our problems is at the highest level in decades. This may be true to some degree, or it may merely reflect the sentiments of the moment, or even the way the questions were asked. Only time will tell. Since the welfare state is no more viable in the long run than a communist or fascist state, most Americans will eventually realize the fallacy of depending on the government for economic security and know that personal liberty should not be sacrificed out of fear. Even with this massive rush to embrace all the bailouts offered up by Washington, a growing number of Americans are rightfully offended by the enormity of it all and annoyed that powerful and wealthy special interests seem to be getting the bulk of the benefits. In one area, though, a very healthy reaction has occurred. Almost all Americans, especially those still flying commercial airlines, now know that they have a personal responsibility to react to any threat on any flight. Passengers have responded magnificently. Most people recognize that armed citizens best protect our homes because it's impossible for the police to be everywhere and prevent crimes from happening. A homeowner's ability to defend himself serves as a strong deterrent. Our government's ridiculous policy regarding airline safety and prohibiting guns on airplanes has indoctrinated us all, pilots, passengers, and airline owners, to believe we should never re resist hijackers, hijackers. This set up the perfect conditions for terrorists to take over domestic flights, just as they did on September 11th. The people of this country now realize more than ever their own responsibility for personal self-defense using guns if necessary. The anti-gun fanatics have been very quiet since 9-11 and more Americans are ready to assume responsibility for their own safety than ever before. This is all good. But steadily, the Congress went, to, but sadly, the Congress went in the opposite direction in providing safety on commercial flights. Pilots are not carrying guns, and security has been socialized. In spite of the fact that security procedures authorized by the FAA prior to 9-11 were not compromised. The problem did not come from failure to follow the FAA rules. The problem resulted from precisely following FAA rules. No wonder so many Americans are wisely assuming they'd better be ready to protect themselves when necessary. This attitude is healthy, practical, and legal under the Constitution. Unfortunately, too many people who have come to this conclusion still cling to the notion that economic security is a responsibility of the U.S. government. That, of course, is the reason we have a $2 trillion annual budget and a growing $6 trillion national debt. Another positive result of last year's attack was the uniting of many Americans in an effort to deal with the problems this country faces. This applies more to the people who reflect true patriotism than it does to some of the politicians and special interests who took advantage of this situation. If this renewed energy and sense of unity could be channeled correctly, much good could come of it. If, mis if misdirected, actual harm will result. I give less credit to the Washington politicians who sing the songs of patriotism, but use the crisis to pursue their endless personal goal to gain more political power. But the greatest combination should be directed toward the special interest lobbyists who finance the politicians in order to secure their power. 
while using patriotism as a cover and the crisis as a golden opportunity. Indeed, those who are using the crisis to promote their own agenda are many. There is no doubt, as many have pointed out, our country changed dramatically with the horror that hit us on 9-11. The changes obviously are a result of something other than the tragic loss of over 3,900 people. We kill that many people every month on our government highways. We lost 60,000 young people in the Vietnam War. Yet the sense of fear in our country then was not the same as it is today. The major difference is that last year's attacks made us feel vulnerable because it was clear that our federal government had failed in its responsibility to provide defense against such an assault. And the anthrax scare certainly didn't help to, to, to diminish that fear.